from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring Charlton Heston and Joan Fontaine in The President's Lady. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's play is The President's Lady. It's based on the novel by Irving Stone, biographer of so many famous Americans. It's about Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was one of our greatest presidents. But tonight in The President's Lady, we'll tell you the tender story of his deep love for his wife, Rachel. As Andrew Jackson, we have Charlton Heston recreating his role from the original 20th Century Fox production. And as Mrs. Jackson, one of Hollywood's loveliest stars, Joan Fontaine. The year is 1789, the Tennessee Territory. Not far from the settlement of Nashville is the Donaldson Place where a few moments ago, a stranger on horseback rode through the stockade. What do you want? I beg your pardon, ma'am. I'm looking for the widow Donaldson. My mother isn't here. My name's Andrew Jackson. I'm a friend of John Overton. Oh, why, you're his new law partner. John said there's an empty room in the cabin you rent him, so I rode out to see if you'd consider taking me too. Well, there is an empty room, Mr. Jackson, but I'm not mistress here. My mother won't be back till late this afternoon. I might even be of some use around here. I've had experience fighting Indians, and I'm a crack shot with a rifle. Heaven knows we could use all the protection we can get. Yet at the same time, I'm quiet and peace-loving. Why don't you just take your saddlebags over to John's cabin and wait for my mother to get there? Thank you, ma'am. You can stay for supper if you like. I was frankly hoping you'd invite me. Well, there's bound to be plenty. My mother's gone to fetch my two sisters. Supper tonight's sort of a family reunion. Are you superstitious? No. Why? Today's Tuesday, isn't it? Yes. You know, everything that ever turned out right for me was something I started on a Tuesday. (laughs) There's Irish in your background somewhere. Somewhere. If it doesn't show in my face, it does in my temper, I'm told. And you, a peace-loving man? (laughs) Come along, Mr. Jackson. I'll show you to the cabin. That was their meeting, Andrew Jackson and Rachel. And that night at supper. Don't tell me we're late, Miss Rachel. I've just been telling Andrew that you don't get fed around here unless you're on time. (laughs) Too many miles to feed tonight to wait on you, John Overton. Sit down. Thank you. Well, here he is, everyone, my new law partner, Andrew Jackson. Uh, This is my mother, Mr. Jackson. And the finest woman in the whole Cumberland. How do you do, ma'am? And my sister Jane. The prettiest. My sister Mary. The sweetest. My brother Samuel. The fightingest. And my brother William. The stubbornest. Now, all these youngins, Andrew, they belong to Mary and Jane. But uh, where are your husbands? Oh, they're home, Cousin John. But there have been signs of Indians, so we packed the children over here for a day or two. You been long in Nashville, Mr. Jackson? Not long, ma'am. Last month. What sort of law cases do you handle? Why, Andrew just settled one of the biggest suits for damages in the history of this territory. Uh, Tell him, Andrew, tell him. I don't think the ladies would... Oh, yes, they would. Well, Mr. Jackson? Well, a client of mine got into a fight and had his ear bitten off. And Andrew got him $4 cash for his ear, uh, of which he gets half. Is it really possible to bite a man's ear off? Rachel, I don't think it's a subject we should pursue at the table. You're quite right, ma'am. You attached to the Nashville court officially, Mr. Jackson? Why, Andrew carries the highfalutin title of attorney general, ma'am. What's it mean? Well, it means that he prosecutes criminals when he can find them. (laughs) Other times I'm scratching mighty hard to find a client. But with $2 cash, he can pay a whole month's board in advance. I don't think Mrs. Donaldson's quite decided, John. Uh, Mother, Samuel said he saw Indians lurking around the hills yesterday. Oh, we ought to have more protection. 
Well, Mr. Jackson, as you can see, we're long on women and children and short on men. If you can endure us, we'd be glad to have you. Well, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And now, Mr. Jackson? Yes, Miss Rachel? Pass your plate and have some chicken. There was sort of a celebration that night, what with visiting relations and a brand new border and dancing and apple cider. And then someone else rode through the stockade. He came looking for Rachel, and he found her dancing with a man he'd never seen before. Excuse me, sir. Yes? I'd like to speak with my wife. Mr. Jackson, this is my husband, Louis Robards. How do you do, sir? You'll excuse us. Of course. I thought you were still in Howardsburg, William. I left to come after you. Why? Rachel, I'm sorry I sent you home. Why didn't you write to me, Louis? Oh, I... I was angry and jealous. I had to get over it. That was nothing to be jealous about. Jason himself told me that you had encouraged him. Then Jason lied. If he weren't your cousin, I'd have ordered him right out of the house. I want you back again, Rachel. I want to take you back home again. Rachel left at dawn. Left with her husband and went back to Harrodsburg. She'd try once again. But there was a limit to what any wife could tolerate. So you're unhappy again, Rachel. You think I've been seeing another woman, is that it? Do you deny it, Lois? Would it matter if I did? Your own mother agrees with me. Your own no, mother... Wait a minute. What? You're in no position to accuse me of anything. I could ask you a few questions about you and Jackson. You're being ridiculous. Am I? Something went on between you two before I got there. A blind man could see it. Listen to me, Louis. I've done everything I could to make our marriage be something Mr. more than just... Mr. Jackson! Do come in, Mr. Jackson. We've just been talking about you. Morning, sir. Good morning, Miss Rachel. I've come for you, man. All the way from Nashville? I'd say this rather vindicates me, Miss Rachel. Now, what really brings you here? I thought you knew. Your mother sent a letter to Mrs. Donaldson asking that someone come for Miss Rachel. My mother sent a letter? She said Miss Rachel wanted to come home. Mrs. Donaldson was going to send Samuel, but he took sick, so I came to fetch her instead. Did she misunderstand? No, she didn't misunderstand. You've made a long trip for nothing. My wife's decided to stay. Did you change your mind, Miss Rachel? No. In that case, I'll be happy to see you get safe home. The only one who's leaving here is you. You'd better get your things, Miss Rachel. Get out. I'm armed and I'll shoot. Louis! You want to go, don't you, Miss Rachel? No, not if it means bloodshed. It won't. I'll leave your pistol with a servant at the gate, Mr. Robards. Now, Miss Rachel, as I said before, get your things. So they left Harrodsburg and rode through the wilderness towards Nashville. It was a wild journey skirting the Indian country. You can pull up now. I think we're all right. What on earth were you doing back there? Crossing the trail. Unless I've made a bad blunder, those Indians are looking for us about five miles east by now. You've enjoyed every minute of this, haven't you? I like to. I'm still afraid. It's mighty good to see you smiling again, Miss Rachel. Were there really Indians back there, or were you just trying to take my mind off my troubles? <laughs> Both. Are you tired? Some. There's an inn a ways up this trail. I, I think we should put up for the night. If you think it's bad. Uh, in this moonlight, we'd be a pretty easy target. We'd better stop. I've caused you a lot of trouble. Been no trouble for me, Miss Rachel. I just want you to know I'm very grateful, Mr. Jackson. You know, Mr. Jackson sounds mighty formal for two people who've just fought off a band of Indians. Well, then, thank you, Andrew. Uh, you 
come home again. Well, I can't say that I blame you, Rachel. But before you go in the house... I, I know, Mother, I know, and I'm sorry. Coming back and being a burden to you again, but it got so that I just couldn't... Oh, you don't have to explain. What I started to tell you is that Lewis is here. Here? Ah, he rode all night. He's waiting for you out at the stockade. You'd better see him. Oh, all I can say is that I've behaved badly and stupidly. But I love you, Rachel. I want you to come back with me. I can't. I've lost all respect for you. It'll never happen again, believe me. I no longer love you, Louis. I don't believe that. I'm sorry, but it's true. Then it is, Jackson. No, it's just that I could never trust you again. You're my wife. You're deserting me. I never intend to see you again. In this territory, a wife does what a husband tells her to do. I got plenty of relations in Nashville. I'll be back with them in the morning. If there's any shooting done between your kin and mine, you'll have only yourself to blame. That evening, Rachel and her mother went down to the river. There was a flatboat loading cargo. It would be leaving soon for Natchez. And the owner was an old friend. I just can't help you, Miss Rachel. I just can't. Now, you listen to me, Colonel Stark. It's a long trip, Mrs. Donaldson, and rough. We've got no room. And if that ain't enough, there's them dread Indians. They're all along the river. I can't take the responsibility. But, but I'm not afraid. Not of Indians and not of hardships. Oh, please. Did you get one of your brothers to come along for protection? No, Samuel still isn't well. And William doesn't think I should go, then but Then I... it's no use, Miss Rachel. But your own wife will be along. Oh, surely you wouldn't let her go. She's used to, was... to this. She can pull a boat and fire a rifle. No. I shouldn't have troubled you. Thank you, anyway. I wish things were different, Miss. I sure wish they were different. We're going home, Rachel. When Lewis shows up, we'll just have to fight for you. There'll be no fighting, Mother. I'll go back with Lewis to Harrodsburg. But before dawn, Rachel was again at the river. Colonel Stark had sent word that he'd take her after. Just get aboard. We've been waiting to cast off. Now, careful now. Tito! Pull in that gangplank! Rachel? Oh, Mrs. Stark, thank you. Thank you. You come along with me, honey. I'll show you where to bunk. Ain't you lucky that nice Mr. Jackson's decided to come along, too? Mr. Jackson? Why, yes. Who do you think that is back there pushing on that paddle pole? It's an amazing coincidence, Mrs. Stark. Ain't it, though? <laughs> Mr. Jackson? Morning, Miss Rachel. Did my mother ask you to make this trip? I, I like to travel. I asked you a simple question. You'll have to excuse me for now, Miss Rachel. I'm busy as a cat in a red-hot griddle, but welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you very much. To it, Miss Rachel. The current carries us along. All I have to do is steer. You're a man of many accomplishments, aren't you? Well, if you've a hand free here, a cup of coffee. Thanks. Now get back under cover before you catch your death. Andrew, I want to apologize. I was rude this morning when I found you aboard. Rude and ungrateful. Look at me. Don't ever apologize for anything, Rachel. Not you, and never to me. Now go on, get back in there before you get soaked. Battered and scarred by the Indians, the little flatboat plodded her way down the river and finally to Natchez. But now Rachel faced a new and terrible problem, for she'd fallen hopelessly in love with the tall young lawyer. It had been arranged that Rachel would stay with an aunt and uncle. They were people of means with a great plantation. Soon after Rachel's arrival, they gave a ball in her arms. Well, Andrew, well, just don't stand there staring at me. It just shows you what a fool I can be. I didn't think it possible you could be more beautiful. It's just the gown. Cousin Margaret loaned it to me, and I'm so laced up I can hardly breathe. 
My heart's pounding in my ears. Yeah, mine, too, and I'm not laced up. Uh, we'd better go inside. The guests are starting to arrive. A moment, Rachel. I, I spent all day in Neches. I've made inquiries. You can get an annulment here in Spanish territory. We could be married right away. And go back home together? No, darling. No, we couldn't go home. But why not? Because we wouldn't be legally married any place but here. We could never go back? Now, what would be wrong with spending the rest of our lives here? No. No, I don't want you to have to give up anything for me, ever. What would I be giving up that means anything to me? I couldn't be happy any place in the world without you. We can build a good life for ourselves here. Marrying here would only be a way of getting around the law. Our love is right and good. Our marriage must be right and good, too. I won't have it imprison you or cost you anything. It has to be here, Rachel, and not at all. Maybe if you went back and talked to Mother Robards, she'd get Lewis to petition for divorce. He'd never set you free. Oh, but I know she'd do anything she can to help us. And then, if there's no way out, uh, I'll marry you here. Look, I'll do anything you ask me to, but, darling, why do we waste months, maybe years, that we could have together? We just decided to wait. You decided. And you agreed. I said I'd go back. I didn't say I wanted to or even that I thought it was best. Rachel, I'm not a fickle man. I've never loved before and I'll never love again. But things can happen. Let's be together now while we can. I still have a husband. I can. All right, I'll go. Maybe I'll be back in two months, or maybe two years, or maybe not at all. Maybe you'd prefer if that. If that risk will make you happy, I'll try to make you happy. Later that same night, a letter arrived by mail rider. It was from Nashville, from Andrew's partner, John. What is it, Andrew? The letter, tell me. It says we can get married now. Here, right away. Your husband got a divorce. Who sent the letter? John Overton. Robots went to the legislature. They granted his petition. Oh, darling, I knew it was going to turn out this way. Now, let me read what John says. I'll tell you about it. Why can't I read it? Andrew, there's something wrong about the divorce. It's not the way we wanted it, darling, but the fact is you're free. How did he get the divorce? On what grounds? All that matters is that we can be married. Andrew, on what grounds? He accused you of leaving him for another man. He names me. Now, darling, please. Please try to think only of what this means to us. It means... It means that I'm marked for life. Rachel, listen to me. The divorce is already granted. We'll make the best of it. We'll not let anything mar our future now, especially the past. How could he have been so spiteful? Oh, don't be unhappy now. Please, please. Help me, Andrew. I need you now more than ever. Help me. Rachel. Make a friend, and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Not so long ago, the city of Port Angeles, Washington, adopted a five-month community improvement plan, a plan designed to teach a community how to improve culturally, economically, socially, and spiritually. The plan was such a success that the United States State Department brought over eight people from the little town of Rosenheim in Bavaria, to see how the plan worked. At first, the Germans were suspicious, but their suspicions gradually disappeared as they recognized the Americans' genuine friendship. For three months, they lived in various Port Angeles homes, learning about American democracy. They visited schools, worked in groceries, hospitals, welfare offices, and on the local paper. By comparing ideas, both the Germans and their hosts discovered that they were working for the same ideal, to advance the principles of freedom, tolerance, and brotherhood. When they finally left for home to teach others how typical Americans really lived, it was a Rosenheim lawyer who best expressed their gratitude and appreciation when he said, I had no notion of American life, since I thought that usually both husband and wife worked, that children were poorly brought up, 
that there was no family life in our sense of the word. I've come to the conclusion that it's a religious motive that makes the American people so willing to help not only individuals, but whole nations toward freedom and recognition of human rights. Yes, like so many other Americans, the good people of Port Angeles had learned that by helping others, you help your country. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of The President's Lady, starring Charlton Heston as Andrew Jackson and Joan Fontaine as Rachel. Andrew and Rachel were married. They returned to Tennessee and Andrew went back to law, mixed with a bit of farming. Money wasn't exactly plentiful, but they were happy. Rachel had only one wish that as yet wasn't fulfilled, her great yearning for a child. But there came a time when she was glad she hadn't a child. Well, John, you're looking very grim tonight. I came by to warn you, Andrew. Warn him? About what? Andrew, can I speak to you alone? If you think you're going to break bad news to Andrew alone, John Overton, you'd better change your mind in a hurry. All right, then. Louis Robards never got the divorce from Rachel. That's not true. He got a divorce over two years ago. He petitioned the legislature. All they granted was the right to sue. Then Andrew and I aren't married. But everybody said that. Everybody was wrong. If Lewis knew about the mistake, he took his sweet time before he did anything. Did anything? What's he done now? He sued last week for divorce. It was granted. There was no question of grounds this time. How could this have happened? How? I don't know, but it did. I'm a lawyer. I should have gone to the legislature myself and looked into the records. And I'm to blame for passing the rumor on to you. I'll kill him. I'll hunt him down and kill him. Killing robots isn't going to solve anything. We'll have to be married again. And admit publicly that Louis Robards is right? No. Well, you two talk it over tonight. Let me know what you decide. Only don't decide on anything foolish. We'll have to be married again, Andrew. And tell the world we don't recognize our own marriage? I told you no. Oh, darling, please, even if it goes, you do it for my sake. Do it because it will help me so that when our children do come, no one will ever be able to hurt them. Do it because you love me. All right. I'll do it. Not because I think it's right, but because I can't deny you anything that's in my power to give you. Thank you. But a second marriage didn't help them much. People talked and whispered and smiled. On the afternoon of the wedding, Andrew and Rachel drove their wagon into Nashville. There were supplies they needed at the general store. Here's a list of what I want, Mr. Clark. Our wagon's right out front. Why, why, that's Miss Rachel out there, isn't it? I wish she'd come on in. She'd rather not, Mr. Clark. And between us, gentlemen, I'd like to ask Rachel that myself. <laughs> Which one of you mentioned my wife's name? I did. What did you say? I was speaking to friends, Mr. Jackson. You were talking about my wife. Sir, most everybody's talking about your wife. Who was it, Andrew? Robard's cousin, Jason. I almost killed him. I would have killed him. They pulled me off. I've got no right to sulk and be mean. I just don't want you to be unhappy. I warned you once I was bad-tempered. They gave you good cause. I lost all reason. I kept smashing his face again and again. We'll be home soon. Oh, Andrew, look at you. All cuts and bruises. And it's just beginning. It's just beginning. That same afternoon, something else occurred that put a sudden and tragic end to the gossip. The Creek Indians renewed their bloody massacres. That's not all, Rachel. They found William, your brother William. He, he's dead. He was on his way to be at our wedding. William? No, no. I'm going back to Nashville tonight. 
And the creeks are aiming to wipe us out for good. We've got to get organized to fight them. I may be gone for a long time, Rachel. The, the farm, don't worry about it. I can take care of the farm. Now you'll need help. I've got more. One Negro servant, you'll need more than Mole. I don't want anyone else. Mole and I, we'll manage. This was the first of many separations from Rachel, and to Rachel, the most difficult. He'll be back in no time, Miss Rachel. We'll do just fine. Why, he'll be back before corn planting time comes around. But Andrew didn't come back. And it was Rachel and Mole who plowed the fields and planted the corn and bent their backs in the blazing sun. If I was young, which I ain't, and if I had any brains, which I ain't, I sure wouldn't marry no soldier. Andrew wasn't a soldier when I married him. And when he married you, you wasn't no workhorse neither. Oh, that's enough of that. Save your breath and pray for rain. The corn they planted, they harvested themselves, and they cut the wood that was to keep them warm for the winter. And in the spring, it was Rachel and Mole who again turned the furrows and sowed the seed. And then Andrew came home. Rachel! Well, what is it, darling? I'm no ghost, believe me. No, no, don't come any closer. Uh, who's going to stop me? Oh, you... You don't understand my dress, my, my hair. Oh, Andrew, I'm, I'm all dirt and rags. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. I was trying to. I, I wanted it. Just to... let me hold you. Just let me kiss you. Darling, you're so thin. I lost a few pounds. You're not sick. Hard as nails. Andrew, what's that? Oh, I almost forgot. Come on outside. I've brought you a present. My saddlebag. A baby. Honey, you said you wanted one, and since I've been away for over a year, this is the best I could do for you. Andrew, what is it all about? Oh, what a sweet little mite. He's an Indian baby. I found him on the battlefield with his dead mother. We killed so many of his people, I figured we owed him a lot. Can we keep him? I don't see why not. When I asked the Indians to take him, they were going to kill him. No. Oh, how helpless indeed. Look, look, he's smiling. Oh, he's sweet enough. I've been feeding him for six weeks on brown sugar and water. No milk? Now, where would I get milk? It's a wonder the child's alive. It's a wonder any of us are alive. Andrew, what's his name? Well, the Indians called him Linkoya. Linkoya? Well, what does it mean? The abandoned one. Well, Linkoya, you can keep your name. And you'll never be abandoned again. Never. That night, Rachel reported very proudly to her husband. And the corn's been planted and the potatoes. And Molly and I have finished almost the sc- planting the, the sc- spring crops. And you'll find the place is showing a, a good profit while we've been away. Too bad you've already planted. Too bad, but why? Because the crop won't belong to us. No, who will it belong to if not to us? Not the crops, nor the land, nor this house. Rachel, I've had to sell everything we own. You've sold our home. Right over our head. Andrew! Honey, the troops had to eat. They had to have ammunition. I had to buy it for them. The only way I could get supplies was to sell everything I could. Oh, but you'll get it all back. Oh, surely the government will make it up to you. (laughs) That doesn't seem likely. They're five years behind paying me as attorney general. Well, at least we don't owe anyone anything. I wish that was so. The fact is, I've signed notes putting myself in debt for the next 15 years. Andrew, if we haven't a house, where are we going to live? I stopped in Nashville just long enough to buy us a new place. I'm going to make it the show place of this country. How can we buy a new place if we haven't any money? Well, that's why we're in debt. I figure the time to dare to pull yourself up to the heights is when everyone thinks you've failed. Yes. Yes, I see. I do you a great injustice, Andrew. Once in a while, I worry about the future. Andrew built the house in Nashville, and he named it the Hermitage, a mighty fine house. There was only one thing wrong. He never spent much time in it. I'll make it 
about you, Miss Rachel, but it seems to me that when he ain't off fighting Indians, he's off in Washington fighting Congress. And when he ain't in Washington, oh, he's stop off... stop it, Ma. Yes, ma'am. There's one thing I made him promise. I made him promise that if I die first, he'd make my tombstone an angel, waving goodbye to him. In the Hermitage, Rachel found the retreat from the world she'd always longed for. Here she was secure against gossip and humiliation. But no wall is high enough to shut out tragedy. Linkoya, who now possessed so much of her heart. Linkoya, the little Indian boy who became her foster child, took sick and died. And the first grave was dug on the grounds of the hermitage. Poor little boy. Poor little boy. Tell me, Ma. Tell me what wrong I've done that I should be punished. Am I really an evil woman? Why do you ask that, Miss Rachel? My husband is persecuted because of me. God denies me children of my own. He takes away the child that I was given. Oh, Miss Rachel, do you think them Christian martyrs standing before the lions and tigers, do you think they asked the good Lord if they was being punished? Of course they never. That's why they're saints. Lily Coyer. Lily Andrew finally came home from Washington, and Rachel invited some of his friends to celebrate his homecoming. The men accepted, but the wives of Nashville still refused her hospitality. After the guests had gone that night... You couldn't wait, could you, dear? Wait for what? Gambling. Oh, that, well, that's nothing but a horse race. I got tired listening to Irwin tell me what a good colt he's got. So you're going to race him. When? Well, next Tuesday. Tuesday? Your lucky day. Of course. How much have you bet on him this time? Five thousand. Five thousand? Should I have bet more? Well, we don't have five thousand dollars. You know that. Yeah, but no one else knows it. And what if we lose? My note is good. No one would refuse it. Andrew, sometimes I think politics have taught you to be devious. <laughs> I didn't have to be taught. I come from a long line of horse traders. You tired? Mm, very. Well, if you don't mind, I think I'll uh, have another pipe before I go up. Then I'll sit with you. Oh, thanks. You know, I'm getting mighty weary of life in Washington City. I'm happiest here at the Hermitage with you, with all my... Now, what are you staring at? You, the way you smoke your pipe. Oh, is there something amusing about it? Oh, no, no, my love, I... It's just that I forgot to tell you. One night while you were away and I was lonely, I tried to smoke that pipe. <laughs> really? <laughs> Did you like it? It all but strangled oh, me. Oh, then you didn't go about it properly. Here now, I'll teach you. And have more walk in? Why, she'd be scandalous. Uh, no one's going to see you. Now try it. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> like this? Good. Just don't swallow the smoke at first. Now, take short puffs till you get used to it. Ah, oh, I do believe I can do it. No, not quite. Now I'll show you how to exhale. First, uh, breathe in a cloud of smoke. Uh, now hold it in your mouth till I... Take... Anything I can do, Miss Rachel? <laughs> <laughs> About breakfast, Miss Rachel. You want I should get some ham from the smokehouse, or you reckon Mr. Jackson's ready for more than pancakes? <laughs> Miss Rachel, you might have read in the face. Is you all right? <laughs> yes, I'm fine. Say, <laughs> say, right. hey, hey, Miss Rachel, you so mad you seen it. Yes, I'm all <laughs> The horse race was an event long to be remembered. It drew hundreds of men and women from miles around. It was a fine race, too, and mighty close. We won! I was never so excited in my life! I told you I had the best horse in this territory! Andy! Andy! Isn't that John? Congratulations, Andy! Uh, it was a good race! Race? 
Well, I didn't see the race. Well, then what in thunderation are you congratulating me for? Well, hasn't anyone told you? Your appointment. Rachel, you're married to a general. Governor Blunt signed the appointment this morning. Well, honey, this is just about the best Tuesday we've ever had. Where did you hear? Huh? And he's been appointed to head the state militia. <laughs> Andrew's been a fine lawyer, a fine senator, and as a soldier, no one can question his daring. Oh, he's famous for his daring, gentlemen. Well, there's a man who captured another man's wife. If you'll be good enough to wait over there, Mr. Dickinson, I'll see you in just a moment. Andrew, would you take me to the carriage, please? John will take you home. I want to go home with you. I can't leave right now. Andrew, fate's been very kind to us today. We can afford to be generous. I'll have John take you home. Andrew, I, I couldn't sleep. What are you doing down here? Cleaning my pistols. Rachel, I had to challenge Dickinson. He gave me no choice. What are you fighting for, Andrew? For your honor or for mine? And if it's mine, then the decision should be mine. There's no difference. It's an excuse to murder. That may well be. Dickinson's a far better shot than I am. And if he kills you, am I better off a widow whose name has been defended? I've already challenged him, Rachel. We meet in the morning. I can't withdraw. Andrew... If I'm to be the cause of all your quarrels for the rest of your life, then you give me no choice. I must leave you. I won't let you be killed because of me, nor will I let you take another man's life. I must leave you. You'd leave me now. No, no, I, I can't. I, I can't. But, oh, please don't do this. If Dickinson kills you, he kills me too. Let him say what he will about me. No man can say what he will about my wife. Rachel, I've failed you a great many times at a great many things, and I hope you forgive me. But I couldn't expect you to forgive me if I lived without honor. It's four o'clock, Andrew. You told me that... Andrew! I'm already up, darling. John and Dr. May are waiting for me downstairs. Now kiss me goodbye. Andrew, do be careful. I'll be careful. Come home to me as quickly as you can. At the time when the city of Berlin was blockaded and American Air Force planes were making regular airlifts into the city, Lieutenant Gail Halverson got an extra special idea. He tied his handkerchief to some candy and chewing gum and dropped the uh, candy chute from his plane. Well, this was the beginning of Operation Little Vittles. And soon from the aircraft of Lieutenant Halverson and his buddies, Thousands of candy shoots dropped every day to the German children around Tempelhof Air Force Base. Americans at home heard of the project and sent handkerchiefs to make the tiny parachutes. To the desperate, blockaded city, it was a symbol of kindness, of generosity, and of hope for the future. Such acts, by you and your friends today, are shaping our world of tomorrow. The curtain rises on Act Three of The President's Lady, starring Charlton Heston as Andrew Jackson and Joan Fontaine as Rachel. duel was fought across the Tennessee border in Kentucky. Andrew had left before sunrise, 
nor did he return till long after dark. They carried him into the hermitage. John Overton and Dr. May. They put him on his bed, and Dr. May removed his coat and rolled up his sleeve. Andrew, Andrew. You see, Rachel, I was careful. Doctor, how, how bad is it? His chances were good, but he insisted that we bring him back to you. This should have been attended to at once. Dickinson was not breaking, Rachel. His aim was perfect. This will hurt you, Andrew. I've got to probe. Just keep talking. You know how loosely that front coat fits me? Yes, darling, well, yes. standing sidewise as we did, it billowed out in front of me. Saved my life by half an inch. When the bullet hit me, I... Andrew. I'm all right. And Mr. Dickinson? He's dead. Oh, Andrew. What can we do? Oh, why won't people leave us alone? I'll lift you so high that... No one will dare whisper a word against you for the rest of our lives. Trust me, Rachel. Trust me. The years passed, and then once again the young nation shook with the sound of battle. 1812. The British were in Washington. The White House burned. Andrew Jackson went to war. And Rachel went back to the field, to the plow and the hoe. He wrote her as often as he could. And as I pen these words, my one consolation is to think of you sitting at the hearth, your needlework in your lap, the clock ticking the peaceful hours away. I'm so thankful you're not harvesting a crop this year. The work is much too severe for any woman. Look at you. Just look at you. Oh, Miss Rachel. The work's got to be done, Marl, no matter what you think of what Andrew imagines. The wife of a general laboring in the fields, sun up to sundown. We need a new plow shaft. Hitch up the team, Mom. I'll go on to town. You eat something before you go anywhere. I'll fix a basket and eat on the way. What was that he said? Sitting at the heart, you're mending in your lap. Huh. And with the coming of the rains, the men are grumbling again. The roads are impassable. But mud or not, we've got to move the cannon. You've no idea how exasperating such conditions are. Andrew Jackson gave his country one of her greatest victories at the Battle of New Orleans. The war ended and Andrew came home. They had a year or so together, but Rachel knew that Andrew was never destined to be peaceful. I won't do it. He has no right to ask me. I've served my country enough for one man. Yes, dear, but who has no right to ask you what? The governor. He wants me to go back to the Senate. Well, I'm not going to do it. I have no intention of ever leaving the hermitage again. Andrew. There's no use arguing, Rachel. My mind's made up. But of course he went. Just for a year or so, but the year stretched into four and five. He was sent to Florida to subdue more Indians. The president made him governor of Florida, but he resigned and at last returned to Tennessee. It's true, Andy, and you know it. The whole country wants you. They want you to run for the presidency. The presidency? Uh, what's your opinion, John? Well, there's only one thing that can keep you out of the White House. And that's you yourself. You and your dang temper. Now, look here. He's quite right, dear. If you accept the nomination, you've got to accept the responsibility that goes with it. You can't fight back the way you've fought all your life. Rachel! Rachel, will you please tell this stubborn mule how even-tempered I've become? Go on, John. <laughs> I don't think you've got a gnat's notion of the kind of dirty campaign you'll be in for. 
They are determined back east not to have a Western president. And there's no weapon they won't use against you, no matter how rotten or dishonest. Oh, little name callings never riled me. Even if it involves Rachel? This is my fight, not Rachel's. We're no strangers to abuse, John. They'll dip their arrows in venom. They'll wound you if they can, Rachel, just to go to Andrew into fighting. They know if Andrew's temper makes him kill somebody, it'll re-elect Adams. Well, otherwise, you think I might conceivably make a good president. If you're not hanged in the meantime? <laughs> well, thank you, John. I'll uh, weigh my temper with my wife and let you know what I decide. Well, just don't forget you've been warned. Good night, Rachel. Well, how would you like to be first lady? And how would you like to be president? Why don't you figure on going into Nashville as soon as you're feeling better? Order yourself an inauguration dress. What'll I do with an inauguration dress if you're not elected? Isn't it a little late in life to stop gambling with me? Here, this is for you. It's a portrait, a miniature portrait. Rich. I had it painted for you just in case you decided to run. It goes in the back of your watch to remind you not to lose your temper. Well, now. Well, what do you think of that? In case you don't recognize it. It is me. Yeah, it's just about the nicest presence you could have thought of. I wanted to surprise you, but I'm afraid I'm the one who got the surprise. Just look at this. And I've always thought of myself as I was when we first met. I don't need any artist to help jog my memory. Unfortunately, the poor man couldn't paint me from your memory. He had to paint me as he saw me. Uh, it's a fine present, Rachel. Here, what is it? What do you want? Just my pipe. You see, I've learned all of your bad habits and none of your good ones. Oh, thank you, Andrew. And so Andrew Jackson started his campaign for the presidency. And there came a night when he spoke in Nashville. Rachel's illness had been getting worse. But unknown to Andrew, she insisted on coming into town to hear her husband speak. And it has been said that I've had more experience in uniform than in government. This is true. I might add, it was also true of General Washington. Are you comparing yourself with General Washington? He was a gentleman. You're a gambler. I can't deny that. I've loved to gamble all my life. It's no secret. Ah, you're a murderer. You killed Charles Dickens. Oh, 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 I defended my honor. He was killed in a fair duel. You stole another I man's wife. I stole no man's wife. Read the seventh commandment, Jackson. Thou shalt not commit adultery. She is as much to blame as he is. We'll never let her degrade the White House. What man of you just said that? I did, Jason Robards. We don't want an adulteress in the White House. Andrew, no. Stay where you are. Get out of my way. Don't be a fool. You're paying right in the hands. Thank God. Thank God we could find your doctor. It's Rachel. Rachel? What happened to her? She went to Nashville to be with me. It was too much for her. She's in the bedroom. Come quickly, please. Rachel continued to fail. Her whole world had shrunk now to the four walls of her bedroom. The election, Andrew. Well, is there any word yet? I don't know. Now stop fidgeting. I'm trying to feed you. What is this stuff? Broth. Maul made it for you. Broth. And you're not to worry about the election. I want you to worry only about getting well. I heard carriages before. Who's here? Does it matter? John Overton, I suppose. Some of the others. Andrew, you tell me as soon as you hear. I'll tell you as soon as I hear. I'll tell you. Andrew? Well? Yeah, we've been waiting for you. I'll give you just a minute, John. Then I'm going back up to Rachel. Oh, she's not asleep? No. Well, then there's something you can tell her. You've been elected. Did you hear that, Andy? You've been elected. 
Andrew, what is it? We're going to Washington City. You're the first lady. You kept your promise. You kept every promise you ever made to me. I was careful not to make any I couldn't keep. Mr. President, how can I tell you, Andrew? Yeah, don't try. You just hurry and get well. You think you can sleep now? Yeah. yeah you try. I'll leave the door. Late that night, as Andrew dozed by the fire, he heard a sudden cry. Andrew! He rushed to her side. Rachel was dying. I'm glad I never left you. Even for your own sake. The doctor, Maul, the doctor. I'm not going to Washington City with you, after all. You're going with me? Do you hear? You're going with me. You're going to be there beside me. I can't. Just don't carry a spite with you. Oh, Miss Rachel. They killed her. They killed her just as sure as she was born. In the presence of this gentle soul, I can and do forgive my enemies. But those vile wretches who slandered her must look to God for mercy. Andrew Jackson went to Washington, and a great throng arose and applauded as he stood before them to deliver his inaugural address. And he opened his watch and looked at the picture of Rachel. And in his heart, he spoke to her. Listen to them, Rachel. Look at them. Some of these good people feel sorry for me. More fools they. They don't know what memories I've brought with me. They can't see the way you looked that first day we met when our whole lives lay ahead of us. But I see you. And what a vision you were that night in Natchez. And the way you looked with Ling Coyer, crowding his poor little life into a few short years. And the way you always ran to me when I came home again. The way you ran to me. Why, I have enough memories to sustain me all the days of my life. In a moment, our stars will return. The Navy Enlisted Men's Club in Tokyo is a pretty nice place where the men of the Navy can sit around and talk, read, or play cards on off-duty hours. It's a pretty nice place in another way, too. There's a box on the bar for the spare change of the sailors, and every penny that's dropped into it goes for the support of their private orphanage called the Home of Affection. Over 50 boys and girls of all ages are fed, clothed, and educated there. The orphanage has formed its own self-government, and the children are learning what it's like to live by democratic rules. With the help of the enlisted men of our Navy, they're meeting the world with a new hope, a new dignity, and pride. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, Mr. Cummings with our stars. And here they are, Old Hickory and his lovely lady, Charlton Heston and Joan Fontaine. <laughs> Charlton, you've been so busy in pictures and television, we always know where to find you. But Joan is the elusive one, always traveling. So, Joan, didn't you just make a flying trip to Peru? Yes, I took my little adopted daughter, Martita, there for a visit. Peru is our birthplace, you know. With all the pictures you've made abroad lately, don't you lose track of Hollywood friends? Yes, but I always catch up with them. And what's for next week, Irving? It's a motion picture we've had many requests to repeat. Samuel Goldwyn's unforgettable drama of Our Very Own. As you know, it's the heartwarming story of three young people and their problems. And so we've invited three of the most popular young players in Hollywood to be our stars. Terry Moore, Robert Wagner, and Joan Evans. What a wonderful combination. 
Good night. Good night. Good night. And come back real soon. is under the direction of Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to join us next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.